Hi, and thanks for tuning in to the Ephesians series. We're so glad that you can join us. We pray that this message is not just impactful, but also equipping. So if you'd like to follow the message with some notes, we've provided them in the description. It's the first link that you can find there. You can open it on a phone, a tablet, and even your laptop. We're going to spend some time in some worship now, so why don't you prepare your heart?
What a great time of worship that was. So why don't you get yourself ready, grab your notes out, your cup of tea, sit down comfortable on the couch and get ready for a great message in this series. Hello, wonderful family of God. It's great to be with you again. Uh, We're proceeding with our wonderful Ephesians School of Ministry. And in this particular school, the School of the Prophets, then we're having a great time. I'm really excited to be able to present number five, part five in the series on discernment. And how do we need discernment in our day and age? Amen. Father, I just want to thank you that as we come to consider this amazing topic, that, Father, you're able to put us in a place where we're able to evaluate everything around us. Lord, that far from being hoodwinked, far from being those that are left in darkness, you have not only visited this earth and shone your light, but you visit your light inside of every one of us. So illuminate our hearts, illuminate our path before us, Lord, that we can walk straight and true in Jesus' name. Amen. What a great topic. We're already familiar with some of the aspects that are uh, covered uh, in the rest of this series. And so I won't be going into great detail in some of these. So if you haven't uh, caught up with those, you may want to do so. Uh, the Holy Spirit guides us uh, through tongues and he activates us and attunes us to his spirit, which is a great part of discernment, is being able to tune in to the spirit of God. And praying in tongues is a great uh, resource for us to be able to do that. Uh, the Holy Spirit also enables us to be led with this inner witness inside of us. That's the thing that it is really activated and attuned in us, the witness of our spirit, the same spirit that, that convinces us or teaches us or witnesses to us that we are the children of God is available in a a myriad of different ways uh, to witness to us what is true, what is of God and so on, which is a great part of discernment. We can be prophetically released uh, to the grace of God in all that we say or do because God is working prophetically through us and the witness of the Spirit is great in causing us to be able to say the words of God, say words of grace. And so that's a great part of discerning as well. All these, while they require discernment, then there is more to the topic than just that. And we're just going to look at some more detail. First of all, I'd like to start with the three basic spirits that are going to be talked about in the next verse. There's our spirit, not to mention our mind or our body. There's the spirit in the world, that is Satan, the devil, not to mention the devils, not to mention all the myriad spirits of other people or of animals or even of, or even of natural law itself. And there's the Holy Spirit, not to mention angels or other be- spiritual beings. The three principal spirits that kind of govern all spirits is our spirit, the spirit that's in the world, that is Satan, or the Holy Spirit. So with that said, then let's have a look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 to 14. Speaking about the deep things of God, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except for the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit that is of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So did you see the three spirits in there? There's his spirit, which is the the Holy Spirit, in verse 14. And in verse 11... The spirit of the man which is with him. And in verse 12, 
the spirit that is in the world. So three principal spirits that we deal with that are around our life, my spirit and why I need discernment because uh, outside of my spirit I have to deal with the spirit of God and the spirit that is in the world. And it's important for me to know which spirit I am tuning into and which spirit that I am dealing with. In John 14 verse 17 we are told by Jesus concerning the Holy Spirit when he was to come that he will be in us the Holy Spirit will be in us and so for us we say that the Holy Spirit is in us and in Romans 8 verse 14 then he says that that spirit bears witness with us that we are the children of God these two things together when you think about it make us a spiritual person because our spirit is activated the Holy Spirit is in us and we are bearing witness with that Holy Spirit, knowing that we are the children of God, knowing that we don't need anybody to teach us anything because whatever we hear, we can discern and take on board whether it's from God or whether it's not. This makes us spiritual people. That is, we are able to discern between the spirit that is in the world and even the deep things of God, i.e. how or when the devil is working and how or when God is working in any given situation in life. There's no reason for us to live in the dark. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 10 to 11, speaking of spiritual gifts, says, To another the working of miracles is given, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues, but the one and the same spirit works all of these things. And so we can see that the Holy Spirit also imparts to us a special gift of discernment. In this case, discerning of spirits. And to discern means to make a, a judicial estimation that we come to a, an understanding or a decision about something. We notice that Jesus in Luke chapter 9 verse 47 has been judging the hearts he will judge things after the heart and not after the flesh and it says there that he was perceiving the thought or the intent of their heart this is a matter of discernment that one thing is being said with the mouth but something else is being discerned you may suspect something but then with the witness of your spirit you may discern that your your suspicion is correct or not we also judge spiritual things by weighing up what we know and hear in God and what we have learned so we are able to judge on a spiritual level this is discernment whether it's of is of spirits at work or whether it's of men's hearts the two things that we have to deal with apart from God ourselves and then firstly other people's hearts which uh, have their own spirit in them and uh, the demons that are around about their lives so we judge things at a spiritual level not just at a natural level and so we are able to do this for two reasons because of the Holy Spirit that was is in us with the witness of the Spirit and because of the gift of discernment that we will be granted a gift or an illumination by the Holy Spirit to discern something and together with the witness of the Spirit, we will understand something about that discernment. The reason for this is that we are in a constant wrestle or struggle in this world concerning this. This is where the battleground is. You often hear the, it saying the battleground is in the mind. But there's a battleground that takes place in the spirit. There's a battleground that takes place in the natural and so in the spirit, there are things that are unseen, which we are working with or working against. Ephesians 2, verse 2 to 3 says, You once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Do you see that there in the scriptures? That people are walking naturally in this life. They have thoughts and so on and desires. 
and yet they are walking according to the prince of the power of the air. This is another way of saying the spirit that is in the world, the spirit that works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we also once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of the wrath, just as the others. And so we can see that this is how Satan works. He works through uh, the lust of the flesh, the desires of the flesh and of the mind, that the, the natural human is, is susceptible to suggestion in these areas and they end up walking according to the desires and the wishes of the prince of, of the power of the air who is just seeding or salting uh, people's minds with temptations to be uh, selfish and self-centered which, from which all of these uh, evil things flow and that's the devil's modus operandi he is all about himself he is all about uh, him uh, being God and, and so he tries to cause us to be his children to think in the same way and no good comes of it let's continue on in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Wow, you can see right there in that passage that there's a deeper level of discernment. We don't just walk through life thinking it's all about what happens just here in the natural. Yes, what happens here in the natural ultimately affects us greatly, but the reason why it is happening is because what is happening in, in the spirit that multitudes of people who are affecting our lives and the things that transpire in life are being affected in the spiritual realm. They are walking according to the prince of the power of the air. And so we need to discern to be part of the solution and not part of the problem, first of all. But we need to be able to discern when this is happening or to what degree this is happening or that it's happening in general. If we don't discern that we're battling against or wrestling against spiritual powers, then we will just walk blindly on and, and tackle everything in the natural. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 6 to 11, it says, This punishment which was inflicted on the majority is sufficient for such a man, so that on the contrary you ought to, rather to forgive and to comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore I urge you to reaffirm your love to him, for to this end I wrote also that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Wow, did you catch that? So here... This is the story of somebody who's done the wrong thing morally. And so Paul has advised the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians to put this one out of fellowship so they wouldn't be unequally yoked with him, so that this person might come to their senses. And now he's saying to them, it's time to receive this person back uh, because previously Satan was taking advantage of them by accepting him. And now if they, if they don't, exercise forgiveness towards him then Satan will take advantage of them in that way and he's saying he's not ignorant of the devices of Satan the spirit of the world works in the mind and the flesh we learn in Ephesians uh, chapter 2 our war is not with mankind we've just been looking in Ephesians chapter 6 about that but it is against Satan and he is great hierarchy of command that he has he's working in others and tempting us to get into the flesh and that's what would happen with that person if they didn't exercise forgiveness then satan would be taking advantage of that and and bringing about something evil in the corinthians so the corinthians had to discern to expel the moral brother and then they had to discern when to do relationship repair and a lot of people uh, are quick to write people off or even if they're not quick, when they do write people off, they don't do relationship repair. Then if we are called to love even our enemy, 
then there's got to be a level of relationship that we can, we can repair. It doesn't mean that you invite a tiger into your living room. You may visit the tiger at the zoo, um, but it's, life is too short to harbour feelings and broken relationships that at least as far as you're concerned, uh, you, can, you can repair. Uh, in, the, in the field, it's called rupture and repair. Something ruptures the relationship, but it's important for your own well-being to repair that relationship as much as is possible. There are lots of things that we are to judge or to discern. We've already touched on in this uh, session that we discern our own spirit. That's what we really do when we judge that we are the children of God by the witness of the spirit that is in us. So it's Godward or, or to self or, or love or otherwise. Then there's the Holy Spirit. We judge the callings, the gifts, the graces, and the fruit thereof, or whether it's natural effort. We, we judge crowds and organisations. I touched on this when we are talking about walking according to the course of this world. We have to judge whether a crowd is walking in the will of God, collective revealed will of God highly unlikely actually but you never know God use, God can use any group of people or any organisation to bring about something that he wants he can even use an evil person to bring about something good that's the nature of being God so we are to discern the power of the air the spell or the anointing that is happening in a given organisation or place or event. We are to discern fellowship, whether to extend fellowship or not to extend fellowship, or having ceased fellowship, whether to restore fellowship and all manner of those things. In the other sessions, we touched on the fact that we are born again. We touched on the will of God, that's the leading of the spirit, verses of the flesh they're all things we have to discern we have to discern the peace which is another way of using the witness of God that the peace of God is the umpire in our heart with our conscience and the Holy Spirit working together you can read about that in Colossians 3 verse 15 new spiritual truth is something that is discerned such as Jesus' complete work on the cross is something that's discerned it's spiritually discerned the natural man can't receive it so to actually see it and understand stand it, it's something that is discerned the truth and the error that we are taught we can discern between the two as it speaks about good or evil Hebrews 5 14 prophetic words that are given to say we are the ones that discern whether our words are of grace. There are other things, for example, in communion, discerning the body of Christ, the communion of faith, affirming our commitment to the Lord until he comes. It's discerning our commitment, discerning the communion of faith. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27 to 31 says... Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we judge ourselves... We would not be judged. So quite clearly here, we are ex exercising discernment of our own life. That we are recognising our brothers and sisters, not just in our mind that this is my brother or sister, but discerning that deeper connection that we are connected in the same way that our, our cells in our body or our members of our body parts are all part of me. 
then I recognise that not as an intellectual process, but a reality. Just go and someone threaten to cut off your finger and you'll suddenly really be anxious about that finger being cut off. You don't want to lose that finger. And so we can reach that level of appreciation of the body of Christ, that we are members of one another. We are part of one another. And it's a depth of discernment that we, we can uh, reach or increasingly attain to. But also, it's not only one another, but it's the connection of the Lord, that it's his body, he is the head. So we're not, we're not a body unto ourselves, but we're connected to the Lord. So there's a spiritual dimension to our connection to each other and our vertical connection to the Lord. And we can't allow ourselves to lose that focus or that discernment. And nor can we afford to not realise when we are slipping in that regard. We discern the love of God. Galatians 4, 6 says, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. In Ephesians, Paul prays a long prayer that we might be able to know the love of Christ, which passes all understanding, the height, the depth, and so on. A great long prayer. He goes to great lengths to explain to us through his prayer how much Christ loves us. Why is he doing that? It's because we need to discern it. We need to comprehend it. And this is something that stands us in good stead throughout life. Why do many people fall when bad things happen in their life? because they haven't discerned the love of God. They feel like either God doesn't love me or else God is not real. It was all a delusion. Whereas if you discern the love of God and it, it does not relate to what happens to you. If, if one of my children injures themselves, if one of my grandchildren hurts themselves, then I do not love them less. I love them more if you're thinking about my feeling towards them. My thoughts are the, towards them. My cap, compassion is towards them. My defense is, is towards them. And so they, they may be feeling, ah, oh, Papa doesn't love me because I got injured. If Papa really loved me, I wouldn't be injured. You can, I hope you can see the faulty logic right there. And God is the same. It doesn't matter what happens to us. His love is unfailing. As Paul says in Romans, can anything separate us from the love of God? Why is he saying this? Because we think that things do separate us from the love of God. And so it is so important that we discern the love of God. If you can't uh, estimate the love of God uh, through the things that are around you, then it has to be spiritually discerned. If you can't spiritually discern it, then it will always depend on circumstances and things that are around about us. We are expected to be able to discern evil spirits let's look at jesus again mark chapter 9 verse uh, 20 says then they brought him to him and when he saw him immediately the spirit convulsed him and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming at the mouth so he asked his father how long has this been happening to him and he said from childhood and often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Wow, what a wonderful story of deliverance. 
We see in this story the discerning that a spirit indeed was involved. In fact, you don't have to worry about discerning spirits a lot of the time. They will react as they come into uh, your presence or as you begin to minister or deal, uh, help a person, then the spirit will often react and it will be easier to discern. We are to discern the authority that we have in the name of Jesus. We are to be discerning concerning our belief or unbelief as he encouraged uh, this person uh, to believe. And then we are to discern our preparation. If we're to help somebody, it is well to prepare. As Jesus said, uh, this kind doesn't come out except for by prayer and fasting. And so Jesus has discerned that about this spirit and he was indeed prepared to deal with that situation. So we are able to discern spirits. We're able to discern that we have authority over them as Jesus did and he was expecting the disciples uh, to generally and we are to discern the believing level in the people that we're helping and we are to discern our own preparation. So while I'm talking about these kinds of things, I'd like to give some practical advice on taking dominion, which is what it's all, all about when it comes to dealing with the enemy. As we've seen above, discerning the belief that all things are possible, the power of prayer, especially in the tongues, building ourselves up, and the relationship that we have with fasting are all important when it comes to discernment and taking dominion. That is, we need to be prayed up and fasted up if possible and that we are in faith, that we believe that all things are possible. And secondly, that discerning the power of believing faith, that demons recognise the name of Jesus. All things are possible, but I have to take that a step further and have it in the forefront of my mind or my believing or my thinking or my knowing, my discernment, that demons absolutely recognise the name of Jesus. Mark 16 verse 17 says, And these signs will fo follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. In my name. So this is not just mentioning the name of Jesus. This is realising that we are standing in the name. We are standing in the place of. We are standing as Jesus. Jesus is in me and I am standing in him and he is in me. And I am declaring that I am in Jesus' name. It's the same as if I was uh, the ambassador to a certain country. They are recognising the country that has sent them. It is as if, as if the leader of the country is standing there saying something. He is speaking on behalf of the whole country. And likewise, I need to discern the fact that when I am standing in the name of Jesus, I am standing in the full authority of the name as though Jesus was there. If I need to discern that in that moment, then I will speak as I ought to speak. I will know as I ought to know. I will declare as I ought to declare. In actual fact, I will speak with full authority. Discerning a word of power is also a key to deliverance. We can see that uh, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 16, when evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word. That is, we are wise to rely upon the Spirit, giving us a word, something to say. We are unwise if we feel that it's separate to our relationship to the Holy Spirit. We are unwise if it is just a mechanical formula to us. I will just go through a process of discerning that I am the authority. For all I know that I could be just proud or presumptuous, except for the fact that I'm relying on the leading of the Holy Spirit. And so we believe for words, words of grace, which are words of power, the word that God has given us for that moment uh, to speak. We can compare that with the sons of Sceva, who presume to use the name of Jesus devoid of relationship with God 
That is not what I would advise. But we stay in the name of Jesus and in relationship with the Holy Spirit and relying upon the Holy Spirit to be able to exercise the authority that we have. We can also discern the leverage of the enemy and bind him by coming against whatever his strategy is. In Matthew 12, verse 28 to verse 29, Jesus says, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods, unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house? So where two or three are gathered in the name of Jesus, then and we agree on any one thing, then whatsoever is bound on earth can be bound in heaven. And so on, whatsoever is loosed can be loosed if we are standing in agreement concerning these things. And so it's a strategy to be able to sense in the Holy Spirit what, what is the leverage that the enemy has. And we can work against that uh, by binding that, first of all. Jesus' discussion in the wilderness shows that devils are quite crafty legalists and we need to be able to discern where the en how the enemy is using the word against us or how he's suggesting things because he's full of half-truths he's very very crafty uh, we call upon the atoning blood of Jesus his resurrection power breaking his hold on death and the resultant name that is above every other name to bind his power so whatever it is we're not relying upon ourselves we're relying upon the finished work of God. Whatever lies he speaks of, uh, about us, we are not standing in our own right. We are standing because of what Jesus has done to us. So we try not to get off of the solid ground of what he has done, but we stand on the ground of what he has done and we stand in the authority of Jesus. We don't stand in our own righteousness, but we stand in the righteousness that he clothes us with. Philippians 2, 2 verse 9 to 11 says therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every other name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father we are to discern that Jesus' name is above every other name there is no name that is higher and that ultimately every knee should bow in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth there's not really any other place above below on that's it then the name of Jesus is the name that is every above every other name and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father and so here also if you look at that last verse last word of the verse that we are to bring glory to God that is the purpose that every tongue would confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father so in our involvement with the devil is to bring glory to God the devil taking glory to himself by doing terrible things to people and holding them in terrible bondages is bringing glory to the to the devil but when they are set free and they walk according to uh, God's ways then they become a glory to God and I would just advise to keep it simple you, you can see using the name of Jesus in all, all of these passages that I've read out to date and you don't find Jesus going off to the left and to the right you know he's had a, had a few short discussions with with devils but it was it was always quite respectful when you look at it it wasn't wasn't a case where he he got impassioned and he was running, running off at the mouth, bringing accusations against the, the demonic. He wasn't, he wasn't running away with pride to, to show off his power against, against the enemy. And Jude's letter speaks about this, that people in the flesh do that. But we don't bring a railing accusation, he says in that passage of scripture. We keep it simple, we beware of pride, and we realize that even Jesus uh, kept it simple and short in dealing with enemy. It is also helpful for more than one believer to be present to agree on discernment. I've touched on this passage uh, earlier for another reason. But in Matthew 18, we'll look at it now, and verse 18. Assuredly, I say to you, 
Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And again I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. It is all about binding and loosing and discerning whatever you agree and so as we agree we're discerning together it's not an earthly agreement that we are deciding together that all three of us we're going to take over the kingdom of God and since we're in agreement God will have to step off the throne because we're in agreement no it's not it's not that it's not going to (laughs) work seriously it is a it is about discerning what the will of God is and as we agree concerning that that is how God releases what he wants to release. Us discerning what he wants to do, agreeing with it, and then it was agreed in heaven as well. Helping the pers- person to discern how the demon got control, accepting and following Jesus, are key to a person maintaining their freedom. It's a number of passages, but we'll just look at Luke chapter 11, uh, verse 24 to 26. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man... He goes through dry places seeking rest and finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. In Ephesians, there's a a great series of instructions concerning For example, let him who stole, let him steal no more, but rather working with his hands that he might have something to give to him who is in need. This is what this verse is speaking about. If we can discern what it is that caused a person to come into bondage, we can help them to put their house in order but leave it empty. We can fill it with the opposite spirit that we can cause them to walk not in the evil spirit, not in neutral, but walk in the positive spirit. So if I was an alcoholic, I would not just be dry, but I would be helping others, for example. Then it will help that person not to fall back again, but to be able to go on and be stronger and stronger and stronger because they are doing something positive. And one of the ways is to help others in the same way in which you were helped. There are other ways, but it's not to leave a person just clean and swept, but fill their house with purpose and with meaning. And so it requires discernment to help people in that way. Discerning demonic activity. Actually, all people have demonic influence and activity around their lives we find in revelation that the devil has come down knowing his time is short to make war on the saints so we can't escape the demonic activity around our lives it's also true that demons desire a body to achieve their will of destruction they will sit on a shoulder they will they will influence other people to influence you they will speak to you directly If possible, they will control your body. That's what they want to do. There are entry points of demonic activity that we can discern when we're dealing with people. Divination, channeling, and all manner of religious activities, calling on spirits of all kinds, spirits of the dead, relics, idols, sacrifices. All these things invite demons into people's lives. And our spiritual hackles should go up when we sense or when out of a person's mouth we suspect an alignment in these areas and we will be able to turn our spiritual eyes on and discern the activity of spirits around their life they won't be far away in first corinthians chapter 10 verse 19 to 20 we read what am i saying then that an idol is anything or what is offered to idols as anything rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice they sacrifice to demons and not to God I do not want you to have fellowship with demons 
So it's not about the cup or the letters around a Ouija board. It's, it's about the spirit that is behind that. It's not about the, the idol or the statue that someone is kneeling down to pray to. It's about the spiritual connection that happens beyond that. So the physical is connected to the spiritual through someone's deference to it. And he is saying here in this passage of scripture that he doesn't want us to have fellowship with demons. So many things need to be discerned as to whether a person is having fellowship with demons. They may not realize it, that through the, through the society that they're involved with, through the practices that, have, that are not God's practices, then they will get an unequal yoke. They will be yoked, that is brought into bondage. A yoke comes upon somebody or an animal, as the example is, so that the, the power of the animal can be harnessed to do the will of the one who's driving the animal. So when a spiritual yoke comes upon a person, then the enemy is driving that person to do things that they wouldn't normally want to do. Does an ox want to go out and plough the field? No, but once, the, once he's harnessed up and he's, and he's driven by the rains and other things, then he... He goes in a direction that he wouldn't naturally want to go and he's serving somebody else's purpose. And so Jesus is not like that. He says, take my yoke upon you for I'm meek and lowly and you will find rest for your souls. So he's not, he's not driving us into the ground, but he is leading us and guiding us and we need that sense of the, the Spirit of God leading us and guiding us, but it's a lot more willing, whereas the, the devil is not so polite. He brings us into bondage and these are the kinds of things that he does as a first step. We can discern the inheritance of spirits. De demonic activity can flow down in families through what are known as familiar spirits or family spirits. And so there can be generational sin or, or curses. Uh, not that we are not free from those things in Christ, but through our family line, there might be a special effort by the enemy uh, because he thinks your family belongs to him in a particular way because he's had control in many descendants over many years. And so he might have a strong influence in the family line. And you may have to be extra on your guard, discerning the influence of spirits down uh, your family line, trying to keep their control because they don't like to lose control. They like to keep it. They don't need permission. Leviticus 19 verse 31 says, Give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. So they seek to defile us. And that's what we're discerning, the defilement that comes about from evil spirits. It's not about the person that, that thinks that they heard something. It's, this, it's the spirit that is behind it that can begin to defile and take uh, control of us. Unclean spirits relate to morality. Spirits of infirmity can bind a person in long-term illness. Mental illness can result or cause demonic activity. We can read about that in 2 Timothy verse 1 to 7. Unloving attitudes such as consistent anger, unforgiveness, rebellion, violence and murder all give place to the devil. We can read about that in Ephesians 4.27. Lying spirits are even mentioned in 1 Kings chapter 22 and verse 22. Even careless words. Let's read in James. There are a lot of things that can give the enemy sway in our lives. We need discernment to realize that. We don't want any part of that. Let's look at James chapter 3, starting at verse 8. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and our Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grape vine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt and fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. 
This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. We can see the whole gamut in this passage of Scripture, that our words can be, betray us or betray the enemy, as he talks about in this passage of Scripture. That if there's bitterness or self-seeking, then it's possible that this wisdom hasn't descended from above, but is earthly and sensual. But more than that, it could be demonic. There's a yoke creeping upon us. It doesn't mean that you're automatically possessed or controlled by the devil or overly influenced because of one careless word. But it does mean that we had, should have a healthy respect for how the, the, the devil works and discern always whether our words are getting off track. And we may not be able to control our tongue as well as we would like as it talks about elsewhere in that passage of scripture but the first step is to discern our words and discern what is behind our words and discern what is the possibility of our words i'd like to start to conclude this session by just exercising some discernment in our own lives walking forward to know how demons act on the basis that they act they entice they want to get us off track. They entice us. They advertise to our minds or to our hearts. We find that in James chapter 1 and verse 14. Then they begin to deceive with some kind of lie about it. This will be good for you. No harm will come from this. Lots of, lots of lies. In fact, every bondage involves deception. It's hard to deal with anybody caught in any kind of addiction without confronting deception because deception got them in it and deception keeps them in it. Ultimately, there's the sin that gets a hold of a person's life. Defilement comes in in Titus with early sweet results of the lie resulting in a subtle habit. A person is defiled. Something's changed. Habit begins to form and so that they become bound. Romans 8 verse 15 says that we can be bound with emotions, fear, guilt, desire, and these can become hardwired in us. Ultimately, we become imprisoned. Luke 8 verse 29 touches on this, and it results in bitterness, in bitter suffering, no idea of a way out, just a terrible spreading torment and the side effects enticement deception sin defilement and habit forming bound it's not only just a habit you can't break free imprisonment and terrible suffering as i close this session let's just activate our spirit and our ability to discern James 4 verse 7 to 8 says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. The best thing for us to do is to humble ourselves before God and be discerning. Not to think that we're confident in our own right, that we can handle anything that's thrown against us without reliance upon him but humble ourselves hum being humble is one of the the strongest defenses whereas being proud leads to a fall discerning the air and how god wants to wants you to bring the kingdom we are atmosphere setters discern the air and discern how we can make a change how we can bring a difference into the atmosphere for ourselves we can believe on the lord jesus christ we can discern the new creation message we can discern that we are christ he has done a work in us he has done it and we are fostering that growth we can confess and turn from our sin whether sexual immorality idolatry rebellion it doesn't matter what it is 
We can repent for the sins of our ancestors and we can forgive those that sinned against us. We can honour our father and our mother. We can renounce Satan and all of his works. We can use the name of Jesus even in your dreams. And this is how I first experienced the power of his name as I confronted demons that were attacking me even in my dreams. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, use my name, use my name. I haven't got time to tell you the whole story. We can command all demonic power to live in that name. Declare that you are a child of the living God brought with the Jesus' blood. Satan has no right to God's temple. We were bought with a price. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Pray in the Holy Spirit often. Walk in the opposite spirit of whatever we were set free from. Share and pray with others. And this will help you strengthen your bonds. Serve in his body as the spirit leads. And this will strengthen you. For when helping others pray and fast, be alert. When you're helping others, make sure you pray and fast beforehand. Be alert to the Spirit's leading and don't just jump to conclusions about what is happening in a situation but discern what is going on and ultimately use the name of Jesus with all the authority that is revealed to you. Father, I thank you that each and every one of us have the Holy Spirit within us just wanting to lead us and to guide us. And Father, I pray that the level of discernment in every one of our lives will double and redouble. Lord, that we will be spiritual people, spiritually discerning and judging all the circumstances of our lives. Let your people be mighty in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Wow, what a great message that was. We're really excited to share with you that this is not just a standalone sermon series, even though you can just keep it as a sermon series. But it is also a Cert 3 course. I know this seems a little scary, but it's actually quite simple. All you need to do is complete the Google form that's the second link in the description each week after each sermon. And at the very end of this series, you'll get yourself a Cert 3 certificate. We're really excited to share with you this series and we pray that it's going to be so impactful in your life regardless of whether you complete it at Cert 3 or not. So tune in next week for another great message.